Tony leads the Queensland Functional Programming Lab, which is part of Data61, uh, which is part of CSIRO. He uses Haskell primarily and has done so for about 15 years. In the past, he has written a lot of Java and Scala, having worked on the JVM implementation for IBM. Tony advises against doing this. Please give it up for Tony. Did I write that? <laughs> That's true. All right, good morning, everyone. Um, so, uh, yeah, um, this talk is uh, not really a technical talk. Um, it's a bit of fun. Um, so let's have a go. So first of all, yeah, this is, this is where I work, um, at the Queensland Functional Programming Lab in Brisbane. Um, I lead a team of uh, five other people. Um, so we generally write open source software using functional programming to help other people, including other programmers, um, to take advantage of the benefits of functional programming. Um, so um, I get this, this is a frequently asked question. So if you have this question, how can I be notified about courses? Um, so you, you would have heard that in the, in the previous talk, is you sign up to this mailing list. Um, and this year we're doing, so a common question I get is, can you do not the basic stuff? So we do that now. And uh, do I really get paid to write Haskell? Um, I don't get that question so much anymore. About 10 years ago, I used to get it all the time. Um, yes? And uh, do you want to play? Uh, I need more people to write Haskell with me. So um, why aviation? Well, why, why, why am I even talking about aviation? So just to give you an idea about why, it's not a really good reason. But uh, this is uh, Archfield Air Airport, just south of Brisbane. And this uh, M7 here is a, is a major uh, motorway just south of Brisbane. And I live just, just over there to the west of Archfield Airport. And I would see this on my way home from work. There's me. Not really, but you know. There's me again. I was like, oh, that looks pretty cool. I'm going to stop and have a look. Um, it's not really. Um, I've never landed on that runway. I don't think I ever will. <laughs> so um, I just did that. And. Uh, my wife was asked this question, as you might imagine. There was a way I won this argument, which was like this. <laughs> and then it was conceded. And this is, this is how we compromise in our relationship. Not really. So, <laughs> so just to give you an idea about how licensing works um, in aviation. Um, so there's four levels, starting at the RPL. Um, when you fly out of Sydney Airport, the people on board, they will have an ATPL. So I, I have this one, and I'll be sitting, I've done my written exam for that, and I'm um, doing the practical exam in about four weeks. So I hope to be able to say that I have that in about four weeks' time. <clears throat> so the way, the way uh, regulation works is it's regulated by CASA, and services are provided by an organisation called Air Services, or Air Services Australia. Um, we don't want this to happen. We all know that you can't catch a train to Brisbane, but you kind of can, but you kind of can't. You all know that problem. The railway gauges don't quite line up. So we have international organisations. You know, we wouldn't want, you know, flying across the ocean. It's like we were told to turn right. No, we were told to turn left. They, they sort this stuff out. Um, and many other things, of course. So how does um, legislation work in Australia? So we have the CAA, which is an over overall act. Under that is the um, CASR, safety regs. We have orders, so um, basically all of these are legally binding. So if there's an order that says I have to do cartwheels, I must legally do cartwheels, as opposed to advisories, which is um, if I don't follow those, I have to justify, if, if a problem happens, I would have to justify why I did not. So these are advisories. Um, so this generally says, this is about logbooks, I'll talk to you about logbooks for a minute, because logbooks was like the, the low hanging fruit as soon as I started learning about flying aeroplanes. This basically says, if you fly aeroplanes, you have to have a logbook. That's what that says. Here is what they look like. Um, well, for me, they look like that. But if you're an ATPL, it will be many of those. Um, and it's a common question, or at least an, an obvious question, which is, are, can I keep an electronic logbook? <clears throat> and the answer is yes. Um, this says you can keep an electronic logbook unless, uh, as long as um, if you get ramp checked, if someone from CASA turns up and says, right, where's your logbook? I can print it out. All right, that's what that says there. There's a printable copy of the logbook. That's what the regs say. All right, cool, I can keep an electronic logbook. So, of course, you can imagine what's going to happen next. Um, I, I see this question, you know, once a day on the aviation forums. What's the best logbook? Well, you can use this guy's Excel spreadsheet. 
Um, this guy thinks this one here is pretty sexy. Um, so this guy really loves the proprietary stuff going on. Um, I don't. Like especially in safety critical software. Um, <laughs> this guy really loves log 10. Um, this guy really hates log 10 when it doesn't sync properly. Didn't we solve that in the 60s? Anyway. <laughs> um, this guy crossed the date line, whoops. And then it all broke. You know, cross the date line, the logbook stops working. Not cool. Um, where's it gone? I mean, uh, it's free right up until the moment you accidentally delete it and then discover that Google Drive does not automatically keep copies. Um, so I see this question about once a week. The question is, I've lost my logbook paper or Dropbox or whatever. Um, what do I do now? Do I ring the flight instructor from 20 years ago that I did my first, you know, what do I do? I see that quite often. Um, it's tragic and funny at the same time. So basically I say the following. Um, if you are responsible, which I try to be, you will be using Haskell. You definitely will be. Um, it's, it, it's almost legislated, I might argue. So basically um, I wanted to, so another thing I would often see is, um, I would see, you know, flight instructors and so on, they would do manual computable tasks with their logbook. Like, for example, if, I, if, if we said, you know, did, what, what's the IFR flights that you did Tuesday last week or something, they would get a pen and go through the, you know, manually go through, like on all Tuesdays, let's say, and just go, oh, was that one a Tuesday? And then, you know, and then they'd add it all up. These are all computable things. So my argument was I should just write a function. <clears throat> Um, so yeah, I just, I just need to write it in Haskell, write a pretty printer in case I get ramp checked. I will use revision control. There are no issues with syncing, last I checked. And uh, so I'll talk to you about what a lens is real quickly, um, mostly because um, I kind of assume that you know what it is and it just solves all the problems, but you, you might necessarily believe that. If, um, if, I said, if I came up to you as you're programming in whatever language you might be using and I said, uh, always use immutable objects. Now, if, if I did just that and said nothing else, you would have a problem straight away, which is if you, tr if you had like say an A has a B, has a C, has a D, and I said take an A and update the D, you would have to say get the B, get the C, get the D, modify, set the D, set the C, set the B, set the A, and your code would look like a greater than sign. Does that problem sound familiar? So you might just go, oh, screw this, I'll just make a variable, right? Um, which would be fair enough if, if they were your two options. But lenses really help to solve this kind of problem. Um, and, uh, same, and prisms and zippers are like variations on that. So, <clears throat> so yeah, I just said that. Um, so basically, I wanted to do something like um, find the first digit. Now, it's, it's not true that many people are asking this question about their logbooks, but I wanted to be able to solve any problem at all. Um, I won't show you that just because I don't have time, but I did write it in Java just to show that I could do it in Java. Um, I can show you that code later if you really like it. It's not that helpful. So um, here it is in Haskell, all right, using lenses. So basically the dot is um, function composition, um, if you're familiar with that, but in, in terms of it's composing lenses. Okay, so basically it says go into my logbook onto the aviator section, the ARN is a reference number, and traverse all the digits that are even and it returns me the type of this expression is a function from logbook to logbook, oh, and successor means add one. So take a logbook and return a logbook that adds one to that really detailed requirement. So the point is not that I'm doing that obtuse thing, because it's not that useful, it's that I can do that obtuse thing. So my goal was to say, give me any obtuse thing and I can do it. All right, so this basically just returns a list of aircraft. Um, so find the first flight in the aircraft with the registration VVO. Um, if I said that to a flight instructor now, they'd get out all their paper and they get a pen and they go, right, where is it? You know, linear searching. And they might miss, make a mistake. Um, what if it was critical? So, <clears throat> so total day hours, so uh, day and night are split in your logbook, so um, four hours and uh, eight tenths of an hour, so a tenth of an hour is, is the smallest denomination of time in a logbook. Um, so I, I, the point is, is um, I can do this thing just by simply composing lenses. And uh, um, if I ever get ramp checked, I'll just say, I actually have a function there that sends it to my flight skills printer. 
Like it just says that and bind and then print to the printer and out it goes. Um, which will give the pretty printed version because CASA doesn't like computers. Um, <laughs> so basically, yeah, just, just to highlight the point is I wanted to be able to say, be able to do absolutely anything as obtuse as, as it is. And I have written that code, but I won't show it to you. It doesn't fit. <clears throat> so basically, the effort required for me to answer any question about my logbook, because these come up quite a lot, is proportional to how hard, how much uh, work it is that I have to do. Um, all of these things, um, there are people right now, probably at Bankstown Airport, Camden Airport, they're sitting there right now doing these things with a pen and paper, making errors, as you might expect. And I'm not cool with that. <clears throat> so um, I call it flash computing. Um, I don't know what else to call it. It's just meat doing com computable tasks. Um, and it's also examined, um, which I find a little bit annoying. But anyway, <clears throat> so I don't know about you. I'm not cool with flash computing. It's just, you know, we make mistakes. Of course we do. If I said find the third aircraft on a Thursday, whatever, you're going to screw it up once. You're going to double check and so on until eventually you get it right. Computers are actually really good at this, as we all know. So I'll talk to you about um, a different subject now, which is um, electronic flight bags or aeronautical data. So basically, this says, um, what does it say again? Uh, this is all about the publication of visual charts. Um, so for you know maps and so on. So this essentially says, um, this is a law. This is under the Civil Aviation Regs. Um, that I must, as pilot in command, carry uh, aeronautical data. Um, and it's readily accessible that's pertaining to the flight plan. So this is an example of a, what's called a visual terminal chart. Um, so there's, that's Brisbane Airport in there. Uh, my house is down here somewhere. Actually, my house is in between these two red bits, which I'll talk about in a minute. That's an army base there, and that's a RAF base. That's an air force base. Uh, it unfolds to half a metre by a metre. It's updated every three months, or roughly. Um, they're required, and I don't open them all the way out. Can you imagine that? I open out my big aeronautical chart, bang into the mountain. Not cool. Um, so I memorise them. So this is actually what goes on. Is, uh, you know, I go, I can't go into this height due to airspace restrictions and so on because I'm over this particular area. Um, oh, what's that again? I better get my chart out, make sure the folds are in the correct spot, read it, and, and so on. And it's a risk that I, that I, I think it's a risky, like it, it's, it's part of training. Um, and you, and it, you, that training minimises that risk. But I do think it's risky in that um, you have to do your folds in the correct spot while you're on the ground. If you don't, oh well, sort that out. And uh, it's, it's measured against risking of looking inside versus outside. During visual navigation, you, you, know, you generally should be looking outside quite a lot. <clears throat> Obvious question, what's all this paper about? Um, so there's a law that says that if you are in Australia, you cannot publish aeronautical data unless you're an approved information service provider. That's OK. We'll use those then. Oh. <coughs> so if the paper charts are the authoritative source, let's fly across JPEG files. All right, so this is actually, uh, it, it's, it's, there's a, it's not quite true. That's a, that's a um, simplification of what is actually true. But um, what actually happens is they don't georectify, as you might know. Um, lines, of, lines of longitude are not parallel. Uh, we live on a spheroid, a black blade spheroid. <clears throat> Is accuracy important? So once again, there's RAF Base Amberley. Um, there's Green Bank Army Base. There's Archfield Airport. My house is in there somewhere. There's the aeronautical chart for that, zoomed in. So that's Amberley. And this says Class C from the surface to 8,500. So that's controlled airspace and restricted. That's the R's there. And this one here says restricted from surface to 2,000. And Green Bank is RA3, that's the highest level of restricted airspace in Australia. And uh, RAF is, um, uh, I believe sometimes you can actually go through it when it's not, um, not active. So basically this is out of the um, air services documentation. This talks about interception um, by a fighter jet, right? And just, <laughs> just a little story, um, I went to an air show up in Brisbane and there was a guy there with his RAF uniform on. I said, hey, what's your job? And he said, 
My job is to stop pilots from incursing on our airspace in Amberley. I said, oh, OK. I said, look, I'll tell you what, I've never done it, but if I did, suppose I did, would you send an F-18 up, you know, and, and do all the, wave the wings and all that stuff? And he said, no, we used to do that, but pilots would crap themselves and die. So we don't, we don't do that anymore. Um, so, you know, we try contacting them on the radio and, and all the kinds of things that you would expect. Um, but it, it actually has happened. I've known of incidents where it does happen, but they're not intercepted. They kind of, like, try everything they can and then just let them go. Like, just ground or anything that's, that's in Amberley airspace until, you know, Farmer Joe's gone over the, over through the airspace. Um, <laughs> There, there was actually um, uh, like a, an event at Archfield Airport. So you can see um, Archfield's just up here, in that D there, just here. So there was, there was an event there, and you know, all, the, all the guys from out west and, and so on, they were like, oh, we're going to go there. We're going to fly in from our farms or whatever. And of course, they went that way. All right, so they just gave up. There was 13 air incursions that day <laughs> <laughs> through Amberley. <clears throat> OK, so we could just use non-certified, um, which uh, there is such a thing. Um, it just puts um, uh, opera operational restrictions. So I'll tell you about this incident report. Now, I, I, th I think this really sucks. Um, I don't know about you, because I think this is almost purely a software problem, um, which is you know, my, my uh, business. Um, there is a catch to that, that claim, though, which is this pilot was VFR and IMC. So what that means? Um, if you're not a pilot, it means that he was meant to be visually navigating by looking outside. And the meteorological conditions meant that he could not see outside. So he was inside cloud. All right, so it is quite a dangerous condition, um, a dangerous flight condition. Um, there has been one study about, and, and the question was asked, if you do go VFR and IMC, what is the average time to your death? Does anyone know the answer? There's a few pilots in here. George will know the answer. No pilots in here? Because it was done by CASA, so an Australian. All right, the answer is 178 seconds. <clears throat> if you type that into Google right now, I'm sure you'll, you'll see all about it. <clears throat> so um, some people are like, you know, I'm OK with this. I'm trained in instrument conditions and so on. Um, but it's even worse when you're not trained and, you're, and your aircraft cannot handle it. Um, just so you know, when you're flying out of Sydney Airport, they are IFR aircraft. They're all trained. It's all fine. If you go through a cloud, it's fine. Um, so this particular aircraft is, is not. It's a visual only. It's a visual flight rules only um, aircraft with modern technology on board. So basically, um, it, it's a New Zealand registered aircraft. Um, so this is um, a, a, a screenshot of the report. Um, so this is a digital avionics system that you might find inside, a, a, certainly in a small aircraft like that. Um, and it's a simple question I have, which is, um, see this aircraft here. It's approaching a point of elevation. What is the height of that elevation? Have a guess. Is it a three? Is it a three? Mm -hmm. Maybe. Could be a one. This here is the height of the aircraft, so above sea level. Is it 3,500 feet? Um, he's travelling 123 knots. That's probably about 220 k's an hour. And he's approaching that point, which is, it is a three. It is a three. So it was believed by the report that the pilot interpreted that as a one um, due to the way that the maps overlapped at that point there. That sucks. That makes me feel a bit queasy as a software programmer. It's like, that's not cool. So um, that, that's called a controlled flight into terrain accident, and it was fatal. So <clears throat> um, this is a real VTC. So this is the paper one. Um, these pencil lines are a bit hard to see, but th this was my planned route. So there's a, there's a point there that I want to hit. I want to fly out here, then up there, then I'm going to come back around this way. Um, and these dots here I put at 10 nautical mile intervals. These are the airspace boundaries. So see the CLL? I can't go above that height. 7,500, 4,500, 3,500, 2,500. I can't read that, but that, I have that from memory. And I do know that this one in here is actually 1,500. Don't go above that, that height. There's a mountain just here. It's at 1,300. Just so you know, Mount Cutha. 
So this is the zoomed out version. Basically, it's just the same map with different markings and different scale. So I simply transcribe all of the airspace boundaries across. Um, it's a bit hard to see, but um, it's these red lines here. So here's my route. I want to go this way. At this point, that says uh, 7,500 and 4,500. So across this point, I can now go to 7,500. And same with these ones here, 1,500, 2,500, and so on, as I'm flying along. Um, and these are radio frequency boundaries, the green ones. Um, and like, to me, that's just, that's just insane um, in that you know, we, we don't want to incurse on airspace. I don't want to bump into you when you're coming to visit me in Brisbane and you're in the Qantas jet above me. I don't want to do that. But I have to know exactly where I am in order to not do that. And of course, it does result in, in uh, what's called VCAs, violation of controlled airspace. Um, thankfully, I've never done it. Um, I do admit that I have nearly done it. Um, I was flying this way. And I was at, uh, I think I was at 3,500 and I was approaching this point here. Um, so it's where I meant to be 2,500, not above. And um, as I was approaching that point, I was a little bit disoriented, like as in I was within like two or three miles, I knew where I was. But then suddenly I realised where I was and that the boundary is like right in front of me. And I was at 3,500 and I was like, holy crap. And I heard Brisbane Centre, I heard them turn their mic. They were about to call me up because they've got me on their radar. And so luckily I noticed about, you know, five seconds prior to that and I'd stopped the power and I'd begun to turn away and they would have seen that on their radar and then I heard the mic turn off. <laughs> and I was like, whew, I never became one of those. <laughs> so um, I, I believe we have software solutions to these problems, um, which must be weighed against um, safety, all right? So we don't want to get that wrong. Um, and uh, I, I feel passionate about this. It's just, you know, come on, we can do better than this. Um, accidents are occurring because, because, of, because we don't have technology, but also we've got to get that right. OK, I'll tell you quickly about um, fixed uh, aircraft weight and balance um, and how that's calculated. Um, so I, I find th this, this is quite early on in my training um, when I was taking passengers, all right? So people like you, let's go flying. Um, you have you you know you put you put your life in my hands, um, and I, I take that quite seriously. So um, let's let's talk about what what this what um, balance means. So basically, an aircraft balances on the center of gravity here. There's an upwards force here, which is called the center of lift or center of pressure. There's also a downward force on the tail plane there, and that's because my boss is going to buy me an aeroplane. <laughs> um, and basically, that that balances the aircraft. So. Um, balance is all about getting that CG in the correct position to make sure um, you know, flight can occur, controlled flight. Um, so this applies to all fixed wing aircraft. Um, centre of gravity in the A380, centre of pressure at the wings, and a downward force on the tailplane. It keeps it balanced. So you know, if we move the centre of gravity too far to the back, um, we would have a pitching up moment, and we might not have the ability to push it back down again, for example. And uh, weight is making sure that we can simply get off the ground to begin with. All right, so there's, you know, we must overcome that weight in order to get off the ground. So we've got to calculate weight and balance before every flight. Um, so how do you do it in the kind of aircraft I fly? Well, my, my aircraft has two rows of passengers, uh, has, a bag, has uh, two baggage areas. I have to calculate fuel and oil and the aircraft itself. Um, each of these has a fixed number, a datum. And then I must, uh, which is the arm, and uh, I must multiply that by the weight. So the arm multiplied by the weight. Then I sum the products of all of those um, to, to the moment. So I sum the moments, and I end up with a number, or two numbers actually, which is the, f the, the, the total weight and also the total moment. Okay, so that's the moment being the position of the CG. And then I put it on this graph. So here is the weight, and by the way, notice it's in pounds. And uh, well, actually, it's, yeah, it's in pounds or kilograms. Um, uh, and by that, I mean fuel is measured in pounds. So you're going to tell me kilograms, right? If I say, how much do you weigh? You're going to say one of these ones, and so on. So I must plot it within this envelope. Um, I must burn the fuel across that envelope and make sure we stay within there. All right? So if so, we're going flying. And if not, we're not. We are removing weight or whatever it is we've got to do. 
this here is uh, there I can do s additional operations. So like we can do, go and do whirly twirlies or something because we're nice and light. So th this happened to me one day. Is, uh, so b actually, by the way, the, the aircraft weight is, a, is specific to the aircraft. It's written on a bit of paper, a legal document in the back of the aircraft. All right, so when I go in the aircraft, I must get that number in order to calculate the result. So someone, this happened to me one day, they said, we've changed your aircraft. And I was like, oh no, all those calculations I did are out because the aircraft's a different way. I have to go and get that legal document again and go and do it. They did it while I was on the ramp, like while I was getting ready to go flying. Um, as far as I was concerned, I'd calculate everything, double-checked it, triple-checked it, everything is, is lovely. And, and uh, this happened, and I, I felt stressed. It's just like I've got to do a calculation again really quickly. Um, you know, Jessica was like, hey, can I sit in the front? Which is a reasonable question, but that changes the CG, right? That changes the centre of gravity. I don't want to explain this to Jessica. I just want to calculate it and get a reliable answer. So I felt pressured. And I was like, you know, I calculated all this yesterday, I double checked it, I f everything was safe, and suddenly this is occurring, and I, I felt stressed, um, which is like later on after the flight, I reflected on this and I thought, this sucks, this is just a simple s function, right? So um, I wrote them all in Haskell. Um, of course, that's the first thing I did when I got home. Um, Jessica's now a function argument. Um, <laughs> I mean, she goes in and the graph comes out. Um, all the aircraft are function arguments. And uh, you might have heard of a package called the diagrams package. So basically, you, you code up a PDF, essentially, or, or a diagram, and then render it. Um, and there's an example. This is a, this is a screenshot of, of the code that I wrote. So basically, um, you know, the red is my total weight. Um, if I filled the tanks is the top of the green. And the bottom of the green is if I emptied the tank. So you can see that this is for a particular flight. Um, with two passengers in LSE, George and Jess. So across this flight, no matter what fuel we have on board, we are within the flight envelope, quite, quite comfortably within there, actually. Um, and so now when Jessica says, can I sit in the front, I simply change the program and put her in the front and press enter. And out comes a new graph. And, like, and that's, the stress is gone, and I get a reliable answer. They're revision controlled. Most people actually do this with pen and paper, go flying, throw it in the bin when they get back. Um, if CASA gets, comes along and ramps check and says, hey, where's your weight and balance? It's like, oh, I threw it in the bin. Um, it's published as a library, it's open source. And uh, I can go and ask questions about it after the fact. So I still have weight and balances from all my flights um, back then, which I, I think is important if, if some questions come up about it. This is just a screenshot of the source just to give you a rough idea. There's me, there's George, there's Jessica. Because you do tell me in kilograms, right? Am I right? Is anyone not going to tell me their weight in kilograms? Because it all must be normalised to not pounds, not US pounds, but Cessna pounds. Right? It's <laughs> slightly different. Very close. Um, there's, uh, we put 40 US gallons of 100 LL AV gas, which has a particular weight, and so on. So all of this must be normalised to give me a weight. So you can see where the stress comes from. Like, do I divide by 2.2 or multiply by 2.2? You know, all this sort of stuff. Um, and this program just, you know, I press, there's a main function, go, out comes a PDF. There's my flight envelope. And I feel very comfortable about that. All right, moving on to another subject, which is about ADS-B. So this is more fun than anything. Um, so basically, um, if you've ever used aircraft with avionics, with electronic avionics, you'll know a few things. They're, crap. Um, they're tiny. There's, so there's one I fly which uses what's called the G430 made by Garmin. The screen is about the size of your phone, maybe a bit smaller. Um, they cost about $6,000 to buy. So there's the zero at the end. That's called the aviation zero. <laughs> <coughs> and it's another 6000 for a mechanic to put it in to your aircraft. Yeah. So I just thought, can I do this with cheap you know, non-certified. I'm not going to really use it, but just can I do it? Hardware. Um, can I do a few things? I asked this question. So ADS-B, what's that? So all aircraft, um, at least all IFR aircraft, or all aircraft in controlled airspace, are broadcasting some information about that aircraft um, to, to the air traffic control, to other aircraft, and to us, if we like. 
So some of the things that are in that, in, that, that radio signal are um, the airframe identifier, its latitude, longitude, rate of climb and descent, and so on. Um, on, on that frequency, on 1090 megahertz, we can receive it with a software digital radio. So I can go and buy one of those for 15 bucks. All right. I can even buy a Raspberry Chip Pi for 50 bucks. And like, here, here we go, right? $100. Can I do it? So I, I thought this. Immediately, I thought, can I go and spoof an aeroplane in the sky? Um, the answer is yes. Um, some smart people have figured out how to do that. So if you go and stand at you know, the end of runway at Sydney Airport and put an aeroplane at the end of the runway, you, you'll see them. I'm sure they'll do something about that. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, I do not endorse this thing, but there is no security in this ADS-B signal is the point I'm making. Um, no different to um, uh, in, on the uh, comms channels. There was someone in Melbourne Airport, I think it was two, two years ago maybe, was, you know, he was a virgin baggage handler and he stood at the end of the runway and he said, mayday, mayday, mayday. Yeah, a few times. Um, not cool. Um, and last I heard, he's still in jail, which is cool. <clears throat> Um, so I think the thing about that particular one was um, uh, he'd obviously read up on emergency procedures and declared the emergency correctly, which made it really hard to tell that someone was just taking the piss. You know? So <clears throat> anyway, they sorted that one out. Um, there's no security. This is, a, this is an example. Um, there's a Raspberry Pi and so on. Um, and software digital radios in, on board. Um, so $20 hardware. Um, let's pick up the signal with some antenna. It's got a Haskell sticker on it. That's how we know it's going to work really well. <laughs> um, I haven't got the GPS plugged in at the moment because we're inside here. It's not going to work anyway. It's got an accelerometer on board uh, or a gyrometer. Um, not a real gyrometer. There's nothing spinning in there, of course. But, um, so this is an example of the, of the web interface to that device. Um, it's giving us a pitch roll and yaw. And uh, pressure altitude, that's what that number is there. And this is an example of it picking up some traffic. Um, so th this is each aircraft that it's picking up. And uh, so if you ever read Haskell um, like API documentation, it looks roughly like this. This is a data structure. It has all of these fields. Um, they're not that nice. I don't like writing data structures like this, but this is how you interface with it, you know, doubles and bulls. And yeah, we can talk about data structures another day. <clears throat> but that's what it looks like. Um, this is the situation of the box on board itself. Um, so one of the goals I set myself was, can I fly across Brisbane, and while I'm doing so, SSH home, transmit all of my telemetry about what I'm doing, like the, the pit, roll pitch and yaw of the aircraft, nearby aircraft and so on, without touching a thing for about 200 bucks. Can I do that? Um, which, which was my real goal. It was more fun than anything. Um, so this is the situation of the device itself, and you can see uh, where will it be? The roll. Uh, there's pitch and roll, and heading. So it's your. So the answer was yes. I thought that was cool. Um, so let's. I'll show you some code. I'll walk you through some code. So first of all, um, I'll show you some. Uh, this is uh, this is the weight and balance code, which I think I've already showed you. Um, so. Who is unfamiliar with Haskell? A few people? Oh, most people, all right. I will, I will give you like a hand wavy explanation of what this code is doing, all right? So this basically is a function that takes the traffic, so that's the nearby air traffic, and returns a string. And what it does is it says, read off the tail number, the signal level, that's of the, uh, of the ADS-B signal. It's latitude, it's longitude, altitude, speed, it's whether it's climbing or or descending, and the time that it was transmitted. So read all these off into these values here, TS and so on. And this basically glues together a string that looks nice, all right, this last bit here. All right, so it takes in the traffic, the traffic being, um, uh, uh, it's not named, yes. It's got the best variable name, which is zero length. And this basically says here, connect, um, connect to the device which is sitting up in that back corner um, at, a, at a host and port and, and uh, loop on that. So let's see if we can get some traffic. Um, demo two, right? 
So there's some traffic. There's a flight. I'll control C that. So we can see here there's a flight. That's its tail number. That's the transmission signal level. At that position, at that altitude, at 263 knots descending at that rate, transmitted on that time. So it sits there and just, um, oops, and just reads off aircraft off there. So one of my goals, yeah, was just to like fly along and send this information home automatically, just to see if I could. Um, I don't know. I thought that was. I just thought that was neat. If I could do it, much cheaper than a G430, which doesn't even do that. Um, the, there was a, there was another bit of code up here, which is essentially. Uh, Read off, read off information off the sensors that are on board that device. So it's pressure altitude. That's a measure of, um, that's a function of barometric pressure. Um, the pitch roll and heading, lat long, uh, which we won't get because it's hasn't got the GPS plugged in, um, and so on. So, uh, I mean, what, one of the cool things uh, it, it, for those who don't know Haskell, one of the one of the interesting things is see how this thing, uh, this one here, takes a situation and returns a string. We might ask this question, does it delete any files or touch any files or anything like that? And the answer is, looking at these two lines, no. I know by proof that it does not. All right, so I think this is important. All right, so does it touch any I.O.? And the answer is no. It says in the type lines 27 and 28, all it does is build a string. Um, and I find this important for reliability in software. So again, we read off some parameters put together a string, and here is when we do some I.O., which is to put it in the print loop, which is reading off, off that device now. So it's just, I mean, it's just sitting still, so you'll get the same roll pitch in your, but in an aeroplane you don't. Um, so I, I found this to be, um, at least that, that was a fun application of functional programming in aviation. I got this box, I threw it in the back, and I went for a fly around Brisbane, got home, and there were my logs. So, for really cheap. Um, yeah, cool, thanks for listening. Um, I, I, like I said, I like doing functional programming, that's my job, and uh, aviation is just, a, I, I find an interesting application. Thanks. <laughs> <clears throat>Uh, okay, so the question was, how was I sending the logs as I was going along? Um, so I, at, at the height that I fly around Brisbane, um, in, so there's controlled airspace above me, um, I can reach the mobile phone towers. All right, so basically, you know, my home was, I think, making a reverse SSH tunnel into the device, and it was sending it back out through that. Yeah. Question? Yeah. I would defer, so the question is, I've done nothing about the security problem, and the answer is I will defer to my colleagues who are really good at that. Um, so, you know, people like Gerno who's speaking, I think, on Thursday or something. So, um, they, they work, so uh, you might have seen Fraser's introduction about the talk on uh, autonomous flight using SEL4. Um, so that's an area um, that people who are really good at and, and spend a, full, a lot of time in their uh, work working on and I, I don't I spend a little bit but not so much um, but it's a, it's an excellent question no doubt about it yeah right at the back yes uh, they, they, they so um, I'll repeat the whole question. Is that the whole question? Yes. So, so yes. So um, I, I don't. So the answer, the, the question was: Are there any certified apps, for example, on your phone or, or so on, for the aeronautical maps? Um, and the answer to that is yes. Um, there are two certified one or three certified uh, for use in Australia. Um, I have one on my phone. Um, and they don't exhibit that problem um, because they use vector, they, they use a bit of trickery um, to get around that problem. Um,
but I am thoroughly dissatisfied with all of those for other reasons, yeah. Um, I could rant all day, so I'm like holding myself back. Yeah. Yeah. So flight planning, um, you know, like flight planning is like, you know, working out, you know, what, you know, which way you're going to go, magnetic variation, all that sort of, make sure you hit your points and so on. Um, and there is software that does that. Um, I don't trust it very much. Um, most, so a lot of it is, is um, biased towards American aviation and, and so on. So in Australia, there is one. Uh, so there's Oz Runways is, the, is one of the main uh, vendors. And um, uh, what's the other one? Start, uh, Avplan and Jefferson, which is the American one. So I don't endorse any of those, um, but you can use them. They're, if you go and look... Um, on the CASA website, they'll say, if you use electronic flight bags, use one of these three. And I'm sitting here saying, no thanks, I'll use paper and write my own code. Yeah. Help me out with that. Yeah. Yeah. Can, can you pull up the uh, conversion code you had for the units in your editor? Uh, n that's not the conversion code, that's using the conversion code. Yeah. So this, this doesn't do the conversion, but yeah. Okay, so the question was, which operator is this um, caret dot um, when it's like a number followed by a unit? And the answer is it's a lens operator. It's, um, so kilograms is actually a lens, or I think it's an isomorphism actually. So basically you can go from kilograms to the normalised um, unit and then back again without losing information, which is called an isomorphism. And that, that operator there means view through that isomorphism. So um, view through kilograms, number 80. All right, and then it, it takes care of all the normalization. So me, the user of the code, which is, it, this is me being the user of that code, I never get to see the normalized uh, unit that's underneath. Yeah, so same for, you know, pounds, um, inches. There's Cessna pounds somewhere in there. Oh, it's in the other code, yeah. All right. Yeah. Is it, is it choosing rational as the number of them? Um, I can't remember. I think it might be, actually. It's either rational or uh, fixed. Can't remember. Yeah. All right. Any other questions? Oh, yeah. Do you have unit tests or do you not use them? This is so awesome. Uh, good question. <laughs> good question. So the question was, do I have unit tests? Or do I not do that because this is so awesome? Um, and the answer to this question is um, yes, I do have unit tests. Um, so types, certainly in Haskell, which is, which is what I tend to use, I use types a lot. Um, but there is, there is a degree to which I cannot use types. Um, there, be, there, there becomes like a practical limitation where I simply can't anymore. And for that, I make up for with tests. So yes, I do. Um, for, for, again, back to your security question, for people who use languages like Isabel, um, they don't. They generally don't, right? So they, they, they've got a much, or I don't know if that's true, actually. It's more like um, the need to do so is much less significant. Yeah. All right. Um, Uh, th what's the biggest advantage of using functional programming? Now, how much time do we have? <laughs> um, so, to, to give you the, the, the best summary answer that I can give you, um, I, I quite enjoy the fact that I can look at these types and I can say, did they do any I.O.? Or did they use an, a value or a variable somewhere that I, that I cannot see? And I, I can get a really reliable answer to that question, which is no. Or when they do, yes. Or, or they might actually. So the, the advantage in this case is, um, so um, I, I don't know about you, but my, my experience has been something like you write really neat code and then the project manager knocks on your door and says, hey, we need to change the weight. Right, and so someone like squeezes in a variable here. They do like, you know, C equals C plus one or whatever it might be. The project manager says C needs to be one more. So someone does this 
and it's still of the type weight, and you, and you have to, you know, someone will go and write a comment at the top or something, it's like, oh, we had to update C because the, and so on. And the answer to the question, does this occur, is no, it simply won't compile. So that's the best summary answer I can give you in a short amount of time. Um, a longer answer I can talk to you next week. Um, or no, where are, we, where are we doing it next week? Melbourne, yeah, if you're in Melbourne. <coughs> yeah. Uh, how comfortable are you for other people to use the code and are there any liability issues? <laughs> that's a good question, yeah. So the, the question is how comfortable am I for others to use the code and what is the liability? Um, the answer to the question is at least as well as anything else. All right, so which is, which, like if you set a low standard, and like I just think I've done a little bit better, not a lot. And for liability, it's like, um, yeah, I take risks. Here I am. Um, you know, it's open source. It's, it's got all the usual things in the license. It's just a calculator. Do with it what you will and all that sort of stuff. What aeroplane, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Part of the issue is that a lot of the like Angular and software has to be formally verified. Oh. <laughs> yeah, it, so the question is: Is part of the issue that a lot of avionics software has to be formally verified? Um, the issue is that it is not formally verified. <laughs> um, it is. So, it is somewhere between uh, not verified at all and uh, lots of labor verified. So if you, I've certainly worked on really large software projects where the way we test the software is we write up a test plan and we give it to QA and then they tick all the boxes. And then they go, yes, it works, ship it or, or not. And I, I, I am really uncomfortable with this process. Um, so I would... I would dearly love for our avionics to be formally verified, or at least some component of it, um, so that we can say to you, yes, it works, here's the maths. Um, now, what, what are the penalties of that? First of all, it's a lot of work. So, so ga suppose we're Garmin, you and I, we write some software and we say, hey, can you verify, you know, can you certify this? And they say, the first thing they say is, can I have some money? And you go like, here's some millions. And then they sit down and do a lot of work, and they go, yep, you're good to go or, or, or not. Um, all of that cost gets transferred onto you, the user of aviation. Um, and I would argue that the reliability did not go up very much by all of that work. So I would like to minimise the cost and improve the reliability. So the question organisations like CASA have is, can we improve the reliability, or at least not compromise on the reliability or, or the safety component, while minimising the cost. And I think formal verification is a really good answer to that. And yeah, I could rant about that again all day too. All right, yep. Did I? No, I hope not. Um, no, I don't. Um, so the question was, do I use the default prelude, which is, which is a module that ships with Haskell? Um, and the answer is no. And, and then the, the next question was, what do I use instead? Um, which is, I have another module which pulls what I believe to be all the useful bits out of the Prelude and puts some other bits that I think... So I'm very opinionated about the Prelude, right? It's like, there's all the good bits, I'll have those. Remove all of those other bits. Here's the good bits, put all those back on top, and I'll call this my Prelude. That's what I use. Yeah? Is your weight up to date? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think so. <laughs> I should check. So it's a good point. I mean, I'm going to have to change that, right, one day. So it'll be me on this date and me on another date and so on. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, all right. Is that it? All right, thanks, everyone, for listening. Cool. <laughs>